Go ahead. All right, I'm Patrick, and this is Charles, and now we're doing Chapter 20, Golf and Club Management. A little background information. Uh, the game of golf itself was originated and founded in Scotland in the historic St. Andrews Golf Course. I'm sure you all have heard of it at some point. And uh, the idea of the country club kind of evolved slowly in our country. It started off small, basic, kind of a getaway, and kind of built up to what it is nowadays. And uh, it also led to the development of club management and that position and all it entails, and the responsibilities and guidelines that help run and make PJ events successful and country clubs successful. And in the last decade, golf has really kind of blown up in America. Over 30 million Americans have played golf on over 16,000 golf courses. In the last 25 years, it's actually grown four times as faster, four times faster than our nation's population, which is insane. Um, so just a little bit more background information about the history of golf, the game. was uh, actually introduced in America back in the 19th century in Yonkers, New York. There's a small golf course there that actually started as a three-hole course and then eventually became an 18-hole course. Um, they saw a big jump at the beginning of the 1880s through 1920 um, because there was many private golf courses being built. People were joining. They really liked the fact that they could get out of the city and enjoy some time with some friends. Um, 1895, the United States Golf Association was established which made golf an uh, official competitive sport. Um, 1919 was a great big year um, and that was when the club managers, the club managers of America, Boston, and the PGA were all created um, starting really the beginning of what is professional golf. Um, through the 1950s and 60s, this was after World War II was over and the Great Depression, this was a massive jump in a lot of golf um, just because of the fact that people wanted to get out of the rural areas and really enjoy the countryside they enjoyed spending time with um, like-minded people. In the 70s, golf um, as, a, as a sport itself was growing strong with champions like Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer who drew crowds that PGA had never seen before. Um, and this really made PGA Tour and the championship a national event. Um, and then in the early 2000s, once the, our economy started to lower, um, that's when you actually saw a down and indirectly um, in decrease in the nation's interest in golf. Um, that's kind of a reoccurring theme that we've, that we've discovered, that the lower the economy, um, the less golf is played. All right, and uh, now the concept of the country club. The country club itself is located in a country-like setting, lots of trees, lots of grass, nature, all that good stuff. And the first country club that was really established in our country was the Brookline Country Club in Boston, Massachusetts. It was established in 1882. And it's kind of like the blueprint of the founding spot of what a country club is now. Like they had the restaurants, they had the golf course. Now it's kind of taken to a little bit extreme these days, but basically the foundation of the country club is Brookline. And most notably, um, the idea of sportsmanship is huge in golf. It's a gentleman's game. People, when, when they cheat or when they mess up on accident, they give themselves up right away. You see it all the time in golf. And they really established it there. And what's even crazier about it is professional sports back then was run by gamblers. It was run by low lifes, like people that weren't really that high regarded in society. And so the fact that they made this principle is great. You kind of set the path on what we do now today with shaking hands after games and all that good stuff. And it was also a way for the social elite to meet other social elites. Indirectly conduct business without actually conducting business and just they, people, they pretty, pretty much thought they were better than everyone else, so they just wanted to be around people like them. Um, during the club development stage, um, there are two main types of clubs, which is still how it is today, the public and the private club. When it comes to the public club, it's basically what um, most people are familiar with. If you can pay, then you can play. The whole entire country club of a public club is funded by people that come to rent or pay to play or rent, um, eat at, the, at their possible restaurant. Sometimes they have food and beverage options and stuff like that, but that's not always the case. Um, then you also have the private clubs. These are usually a little bit more um, established. They, there's more actually private clubs, the equity and non-equity clubs. Um, so there could also be positive, possible selective membership where the group or someone would vote um, to let a member actually into the club. Um, but there's also prices for people, even if you join yourself, it's usually pretty expensive. Um, these courses are sometimes run just basically off of the funds that they get from members. So it just depends on what type of uh, club development you would go into to play the game of golf. Alright, the industry format. Public clubs is pretty straightforward. They hire a general manager type. They may, he may or may not be called a general manager, but he runs the day-to-day -day operations. And he reports to either the city management office if it's run by the city, 
or if owned by a management group, like a board of directors type. And then for, um, they make their money basically, like Charles said, through rentals and people coming to play. They're not huge in secondary facilities like tennis courts, pools, snack bars. And they offer, just offer a cheaper financial option for people who just love the game of golf and want to learn about it. Um, now when it comes to the industry format of the private clubs, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, with the equity, equity clubs, you have clubs that are owned by the members. This means that all the money that the members are paying is going directly back into um, the, the club itself. Um, this club would usually hire a general manager and that would run that day-to-day -day operations um, that Pat was talking about and they report directly to the club members as, their, as who they would say they would be their boss. Um, now there's also the private non-equity clubs. This means it's usually owned by an individual or maybe a smaller group of people. Um, but this is a corporation almost. This managed directly by a single general manager that they would hire. Um, and that general manager still follows the policy of an owner. Um, that owner would give them the complete authority to operate the club and accept new members subject to owner oversight um, overview. All right, my challenging issue that we both came up with was uh, well, private clubs have changed drastically throughout history. Like now they have like spas, tennis courts, pools, basketball courts. They have mobile vendors. Yeah, yeah mobile vendors. They have five star restaurants. And honestly, like all these like all these positions that they need to have now to run all these, like you have a food and beverage management position, a sport and golf management position, a grounds facility management position. It's gonna like higher uh, operation costs, which means that uh, which eliminates the middle class from like possibly joining or wanting to join. And if one were to look at the popularity of golf over the last hundred years, every time our economy is booming, the game of golf is booming. Every time it starts to go down, people don't really care about it too much because we're worried about other things. But I mean, basically the question I have is what happens to all these top tier facilities if the economy tanks again and not everyone can afford to stay a member? These clubs just either fold or become non-existent or irrelevant. And that just eliminates so many people that can enjoy the game of golf. And my career vocation, well, I'm not directly like trying to get have a career in golf, but I do aspire to have a, like a player's operations position or like a high school athletic director kind of type. And many of the principles that I read about in this article about the general manager and how he oversees everyone and all their operations kind of like gave me a lot of ideas and showed me what steps I need to take to get to those places and all that good stuff. And, Kind of gave me like more ideas about management classes I can take, just to kind of gain more understanding of what I need to do, so I can manage effectively and professionally. Um, golf again for me is not really the exact sport I'm interested in. Um, I do like the management aspect that is required for you know a golf facility to run smoothly. Um, the facility and club management were the key development to the game of golf in America. Without the club, the game of golf wouldn't really be where it is today. Um, so I wanted to, I, it just sparked my interest because I know that I've been talking about wanting to work in facility management myself. Um, sports in this article, they thoroughly discuss the difficulties of managing a sport facility. Golf is very unique in the fact that that facility is constantly changing for players. I mean, it's a new venue, new weather, new holes, they're redoing courses all the time, having to keep them up to date, especially if it's a PGA course, that's in tip top shape. Um, so this article really discussed how important smoothly running golf courses to the event or even the golf tournament necessarily. Um, which is constantly changing. Basically, this art article greatly influenced the concepts and principles I viewed important to facility management, um, and I will need more information, information, classes, and experience to try and get to this level where running a facility like this is, is manageable for someone like myself. Thank you.